we'll talk about web hosting. Um, in other words, you complete your website, you want the world to see it. So we'll, we'll talk about that part of the process. Um, we also have the course evaluation. On Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday, um, we will talk about JavaScript. Um, I, you know, you can't do JavaScript justice in just one class session, but I want to at least introduce you to what its capabilities are and, uh, and uh, what it adds to the, what it adds to the, to the party, um, what it adds, uh, what kind of functionality it provides that the other technologies that we have discussed uh, don't provide. In the meantime, uh, as you know, the project is due uh, next week. Um, and therefore, um, I would like to see you, you know, in lab talking to other people about your project, showing them your project, and so on. For those of you in the online class, you can do that via the bulletin board, or you can come in, um, and so on. We do not meet next week, okay? Um, you just turn in your final uh, project, and that's it. So there's no, like, final exam or anything that you need to show up for. All right. Um, any questions about that sort of logistics that I just discussed? Okay. It's not recognizing when you put a name in. What What do you mean by that? Um, well, you know how uh, we're supposed to sort of, I guess, validate it with, with the certified script. Uh -huh. so, so I write it, you know, I, I have a pretty form and everything. And it's like, okay, he just says name, and I type in my name. And then when I, when I put it against you, it just says name, and it's blank. Okay. Um, what, what it probably is is the, the field that, you, uh, the name that you've given that field probably doesn't match the name what it needs to be. Um, and, and that, it, it would be case sensitive as well. So, so check to make sure that, you know, if it's TXT capital NAME, that it is TXT capital NAME. If, if, uh, and then we can look at it in lab. But that would be the first thing to look at. It has to, has to match up exactly right. All right. So we've created a website, and we want to make it available for the world. What are some of the steps that you need? What are some of the things that you, you need uh, to make that happen? First of all, you need a domain name, right? Uh, a domain name is, is the name of your website. It's the name that people will know to go to your website for. Um, every website on the web has an IP address, all right? In fact, everyone connected to the web has an IP address. The difference between your IP address and the IP address at Google is that yours might be not a permanent IP address. In other words, depending on the kind of modem connection you have, it might change every time you connect. All right? um, or it might change periodically. You know, if, your, you know, if your cable modem goes down and it's down for a few days, maybe when it comes back up you'll have a different IP address. All right, But to have a website, you need a permanent IP address because that's how websites are accessed, through their IP address. And what's an IP address? Well, it looks something like this. Here's an example of an IP address. This is an actual IP address of a site that you probably all have used. It said that the bulb needed to be changed? Yeah, it said it on the screen. Oh, okay. I thought it actually said it. Like, <laughs> would you please change my bulb? <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow, <laughs> technology these days. I was a little scared for this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be that time of the semester. I understand. This is a website that I'll bet every one of you have used. And this is what an IP address looks like. Four sets of numbers that are between 0 and 255. 
Now, some of them might have special meanings, like 127.0.0.1 means something special. All right? But in general, three numbers, or I'm sorry, four numbers, 0 to 255. Anyone, anyone know what this site is? You've all accessed it. Oh, Google. Either you have a great memory or I am very predictable. Because <laughs> this is the IP address for Google. But, take that away, what's the IP address for Google? 74.125.26. Exactly. <laughs> Alright. The point is, is that's something that you're not going to remember as easily as Google. So therefore, you have domain names. And what a domain name is, is it's an easier way to, re to, to maintain a, uh, uh, or, or an easier way to refer to a website. So instead of having to know this, you know that google.com is the name for it, and it points to this. I mean, I guess an analogy, I don't know if it's a good analogy or not, would be that you know, we could go around referring to people by their social security numbers, right? But that'd be hard to remember, all right? Um, so people have names, and it's easier to remember a name, all right? And you can refer to a person that way. Sort of the same idea here. It all has to boil down to an IP address. But since that's hard for people to work with, there's names. Now, what you need to do is there's an organization that sort of registers these names, all right? And you need to, when you want to use it, you can register it. It'll make sure no one else has that name, right? Because there can't be two Google.coms, one that you get if you happen to be in the U.S., one that you get if you're in Europe, let's say. There can only be one Google.com, so that needs to be unique. So someone has to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, making sure that happens. Then you need to register where, what the IP address is for your domain name. And that then goes to all the different name servers throughout the internet, which are kind of like phone directories, where you put in a name and it gives what the IP address is. Now, a lot of times when you're making changes like this, when you're first registering, it's not like there's one name server for the entire internet. And the, these name servers get uh, updated automatically, but it takes a while for it to propagate. So in other words, if I were to go and create a website now, it wouldn't necessarily, and then I went home and tried to access it, it wouldn't necessarily be able to recognize it. Probably within a day, it would, it would be able to recognize it. All right. Bottom line is the first thing you need is you need a domain name. Um, there are different uh, top-level domains. The top-level domains, ironically, are the things at the end. All right. And those have different meanings. Some of them mean more than others. All right. Dot com means commercial, dot net means a network, dot org means an organization. These don't typically mean anything in the sense that I could register, if I wanted to register a new site, I could register it as a dot net or a dot org or a dot com and, and no problem. Uh, it might be a little bit more to register for one of the other ones. And again, it's sort of a preference thing which one that you get. Uh, it's a perception of some that a .org sort of increases your credibility, you know, but I don't know. I mean, given the fact that, you know, anyone could go and register it, I don't know if it truly does. Now, some of them, some of the domain names you have to have some credentials to do. For example, a .edu, which means education, or a .gov, which means government, or a .mil, which means military. Uh, in addition, you can add on for many of them a country code. All right? So it can be .co.uk to indicate a UK site and so on. There's been talk and there has been added on uh, some other sorts of, of top level domains, but again, not terribly exciting to talk about. For most purposes, you're going to pick a, a .com, a .org, or a .net. Uh, name. Okay, then you need an internet service provider. All right, I, I probably should have said this first, and I don't mean internet service provider. I, I actually mean a web hosting. I mean in some respects they're an internet service provider, but I really mean a web hosting service. 
Now you need to have those when you register the domain or simultaneously to registering the domain because your web hosting company will give you the IP address that you're going to have. All right? And the web hosting company is going to be the place where your website lives out on the net. And it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, uh, an internal to your organization. In fact, it's likely not to be. Most organizations find it not worthwhile to, to, to host their own website. You know, maybe if you're a large organization you will, but you know, it's kind of like running your own phone lines, right? I guess you could do it, but it, is it really worth the effort, given the fact that there's people that do this all the time? And they're going to make sure that the, the server is patched for uh, uh, latest security issues and so on and so forth. All right? You can either get a dedicated server from one of these web hosting companies or a shared server. Um, the dedicated server would mean that the web server, the machine that was running the web server software, uh, is dedicated just to you. So that would, you know, give you a little bit more horsepower as opposed to a, a shared server whereas one machine is actually hosting a number of different sites. We won't get into the logistics of how you set up a web server. The web server really is it's a machine that's running certain software that's waiting for requests to send web pages. All right? So you can either get a dedicated or a, uh, a shared server. Beyond that, here's some things to look for or to look uh, at when you're considering a server. Number one, would be the languages that it supports. Now, by languages I don't mean HTML, CSS, and, and JavaScript. Those the web server doesn't run, so there's never an issue with the web server being able to do those. But um, what I mean is the server side languages it supports. And again, it's not really anything that we've gone into in too much detail in this class, but you need to know if your web server can support the server side scripting language that you're going to use if you're going to use one of these. So ASP.NET or PHP are the two big common ones. This one being a more of a Microsoft solution, this one being more of a Linux solution, although you can run PHP across platforms. But typically if you uh, were contracting a web uh, service, if you asked for a PHP server you'd probably get a Linux machine. If you asked for a .NET one you'd definitely get a, a Windows machine. Other things. How much space you have on it. All right. Um, you know, how much space do you have for files? Um, generally speaking, unless you're getting into some really big files for, um, you know, for, for videos and, and so on, you know, you're probably, um, you're probably, you know, you, you don't necessarily need for just a, a set of basic pages. You don't necessarily need tons of space. There's also how much bandwidth you're allowed. In other words, how many bytes of data you're allowed to transfer to that. In other words, if you're a site that, get, that gets visited a thousand times a day and is delivering a lot of different web pages, you may need a more expensive plan to allow for more bandwidth than a site that's visited five times a day and only delivers a couple of web pages. So you pay in terms of how, much, how many bytes you can transmit that, that your server can serve up over uh, a period of time. All right. Um, how many databases are allowed? This sort of goes along with the server-side scripting languages. In more advanced web applications, um, your server-side scripts connect to a database. Well, how many databases does it support? Can, does it just support one? Can you have five databases? Uh, and so on. These are some of the main factors uh, to look at when you're considering a server. You really need to know the particular problem that you're, you're, going, uh, you're going for and, and um, know what, what you expect the traffic to be and, and then monitor the traffic uh, once that you've gotten it. Does anyone have any experience with web hosting companies? 
What what have you used? Uh, Pacific Coast. Pacific Coast, and and how how do you like it? Okay. One one student mentioned the particular one he has has uh, installation of like uh, canned websites or canned applications using something called uh, Scriptaculous, and uh, again that that's sort of beyond the basic um, the basic sort of functionality of a web hosting company. That's sort of a bells and bell and whistle. That it could make the difference between choosing one versus the other. Experience you've had. Uh-huh. Never like them, so then I just got a dedicated server at FBC then. Okay. So uh you, you tried uh the this student said they tried some smaller ones and didn't work out, so you got a dedicated server uh at a larger uh hosting company. What didn't you like about the smaller ones? Mainly what I found mm -hmm. was with the space and bandwidth, mm -hmm. a lot of companies oversell. Okay. Right. So they can say you get 10 gig of space and you know, 8 gig of bandwidth on one. Mm -hmm. And really, if when you're on shared like that, if you find somebody that's on, because on, on one physical machine, they can have thousands and thousands. Right. If two or three people of those start using Space, right. It affects everybody else as far as their site slow down, their space. Okay. Even though it's still available. Right. Your site goes slower because the hard drive is fuller. Right. So I've noticed that with a lot of big space offers, mm -hmm. you can end up getting burned in the end. Okay. Um, the student mentioned. Uh, that uh, the issue that he ran into with smaller ones and using a shared server is that, uh, again, given with virtualization um, and all that, one physical machine could actually be hosting a bunch of websites. And even though they promise you a certain amount of space, and that space is available for you, when everyone really takes advantage of it, uh, there could be larger sites that sort of bog everyone down. In other words, they may commit to uh, having a certain amount of, of space available for you, and that's available for you, but that's not really an optimal situation. And it, uh, you know, if, if everyone, and, and they sort of oversell the server and have too many people on it, then it can bog things down. Because they banked on uh, right. but he's not going to use right. 10 gig of space. Right. Yeah, they bank on everyone, everyone, uh, uh, you know, not using everything. Kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You know, they don't bank on everyone eating, you know, 16 plates full. You know, they, they, you know, they set their price and do everything based on the fact that some people are just going to have a little bit and some people are going to have a lot. All right. Uh, what was your experience when you went to a uh, dedicated uh, host? Uh, the, the big difference. Okay. They're really good mm -hmm. over there. Um, but the big difference is you have to do your own server admin. Okay. You have to harden it. You have to know what you're putting on it. Like if you want mm -hmm. PHP or certain scripts to run, you have to have the updated PHP. Right. And when you do that, it doesn't work with right. your old version of MySQL. So it's a lot right. more as far as server admin. Right. The student says when you have a dedicated server, the downside is that you take more responsibility for the server admin, and, and that gets to be uh, a bit of a pain. Uh, the student also mentioned a good word that, that um, I should probably throw in somewhere, and now is as good a time as any, and that is uptime. And uptime is exactly what it sounds like. In other words, what percentage of the time is your website up and available? Obviously, the higher number, the closer to 100%, the better it is. You know, um, would would love it to be 100%, but we know that that's not practical. But you know, a nine, you know, 
if you think about it, you know, even a number that sounds high probably isn't all that high. If you think of 90% uptime, it's like, oh, that's pretty good, 90%. Not really, all right? That's 10% of the time, it's down. That's two hours a day. Is my math right? 2.4 hours a day, right, that your, your site is down, and that's not good. So again, 99%, 99.5 as you said, or the higher numbers, uh, the uptime, uh, the better it is. You know, um, having the website up and working is critical, right, to so many businesses, you know. I mean, when a website goes down, you know, I mean, when Gmail went down, or, or, you know, a while ago, and again, that's a mega, mega site, and I'm sure they have issues all their own, but it's like it seemed like the world was in a panic, right? Um, so, uh, again, um, the uptime is important. The other thing that's important that is maybe a little less tangible is, is customer support. In other words, if there's a problem, how accommodating are the folks at the hosting company in, in solving that? You know, you know there's going to be problems, you know. I've had cases where I screwed up in registering, you know, and I'll admit it was my fault, I screwed up in, in registering uh, a domain or, or um, in uh, any number of different configuration things, all right? Um, I've had cases where a website's been hacked, where, uh, you know, something happened, someone had a weak or no password, and on a shared server, they, the person was able to get access to a lot of different websites, all right? So, okay, problems will happen. How quickly the, the hosting company can resolve those is a big issue. Anyone, the, the couple of students or anyone else that has worked with web hosting companies, do you either have some positive or negative customer service stories? Uh, it seems that they, uh, they have a system where you submit a ticket and um, they prioritize how serious the problem is and that, that just lets you how quickly they get back to you. So if it's a unique problem to you, they'll probably get back to you Okay. All right. The, the statement was made is typically the procedure is, is that you submit a ticket and uh, they look at it and depending on the nature of the ticket, they categorize it, um, the importance of it and the severity of it based on a number of different factors. Um, if your website is down, for example, it probably will take precedence over someone whose website is slow or who isn't behaving quite the way that they would expect it to uh, or, or something along those lines. And again, depending on the severity, typically what happens, and again, this, this does get frustrating for folks that are familiar with this stuff, is that sort of the first line of support is just someone that knows how to read the, the frequently asked questions, <laughs> all right? Because they assume that you can't. All right? And, and the sad thing is probably in a lot of cases that might be true, right? People are, 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 are submitting questions. So, you know, it, it's like the old joke uh, has been done on a numerous TV shows about technology, you know, try rebooting the system, you know. It's funny, almost every technical person suggests that because it works, all right, in a certain percentage of the time. And you get a quick win and, and everything's okay. So anyhow, typically that's how it works. Someone will go and will try like the, a, a scripted solution. And if it doesn't work, then it gets escalated to someone who's actually going to spend a little time to research it and all that. Now, this is something that you're not necessarily going to go in knowing to a server, uh, a hosting company, because no one's going to say, well, you know what, yeah, to be honest with you, we do have kind of crappy customer service, right? <laughs> They're all going to say that they have great uh, customer service. But through word of mouth, through looking on forums, and your own experience, again, you can, you can tell uh, um, how it is. So that would be one thing I would ask in addition to all these other things, like if you were considering a, a web hosting company, um, you, know, um, you know, how good is the, is the service, you know? Um, you know, so ask people you know, check on bulletin boards, look for unbiased um, um, information on that. I have, I have to say, the one I use, yeah, I've generally been very pleased with their, their customer service. You know, when, when there's a problem, they give me an answer pretty quick, and it, it pretty much resolves the problem. So if you do that on a consistent basis, you know, you're okay in my book. All right? And that, to me, might be worth a couple extra dollars a month or 
slightly less bandwidth or whatever. All right, just just uh, the 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 peace of mind that you get uh, from doing that. Questions about any of that? So you do all this. All right, you have your domain name registered, and it points to an IP address somewhere. <coughs> what do you do from there? Well, you have to get your pages up to the web server, right? And you have to get them there sort of in the same state that they were when you created them. In other words, if you have folders, if you have images and folders, you need to go onto the web server and create those folders and move the files in there. That's why I typically in my examples talk about relative uh, addresses of, of things. That way you don't have to worry about when you switch servers or move it from your local development machine uh, to that. Um, many of these uh, service uh, providers or hosting companies offer tools of, of various kinds. A popular tool is cPanel. And let's see, here's a live demo of cPanel. All right, so you get something that looks like this. All right, and you go in and you can do things like I can click on File Manager and I can see all the files that exist on this server. Now, these files are a mess because this is a public demo site, all right? Something that I did not uh, expect. But, you know, you can do things like you can create a directory. New folder. Oops. Or not. You can go into a directory. All right. You can upload files. All right. I won't actually upload it. Uh, and you can manage the server that way. And the nice thing about cPanel is cPanel is a very user-friendly uh, tool to use. Does anyone, uh, a couple of people, use cPanel? Yeah, it, again, it's a very popular one, and you can do tons of things with it. You can configure email addresses. You can configure user accounts. So, for example, if um, I was working with someone on a project, and I wouldn't necessarily want them to get full reign of my website, but maybe there was a subdomain that they were working on. I could give them access to that, and you have a lot of control uh, over that. I guess one of the other alternatives to this is that you can use a, a basic FTP program. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol, and that allows you to go in and uh, it's a program that essentially lets you open a directory on a remote server, and then you can just drag things back and forth for that. Um, an example of that, we can go into actually, I'll just go into uh, Windows Explorer. Windows Explorer has built-in FTP capabilities and I can go to like one of our web servers here It asks me for my credentials, just like cPanel would in a normal situation. And I hope I remember my password for this. All right, there you go. And then once you log in, it acts just basically like uh, a Windows folder. The difference being is this is a folder on a remote server. So I can drag folders into it, pull folders out of it, and so on. Pardon me? There's Lab 9, yeah. Not, not for this class, though. Oh, wait a minute. No, or, or is it? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's, yeah, this is a different one. Let's see. We can find that code, though, if we look. Huh. I don't, I don't remember where I put that. Yeah. But somewhere in here, 
is uh, is the code for that, the server side code for for that. One thing uh, again, web server servers typically follow certain conventions. Uh, among those conventions are typically your home page will be something like index.html. Uh, depending on your web server and how it's configured, you can define a list of names that it will look for. So if I just go to my URL, www.google.com or whatever, notice even though you haven't specified the name of the web page, it still pulls up a web page. Well, there's a default web page for each domain and each folder and all that. Now the one thing that, um, one other thing that web uh, hosting services provide that can be very beneficial are uh, statistics as far as who's visiting your site, how many visitors you have, and so on. There's a number of different packages. One of them is AWSTATS or AWSTATS. And here's an example. In other words, this would say that in December 2001, this website, whichever website it was, has had 33 unique visitors. Now, unique visitors uh, is sometimes dicey to tell, so you got to kind of take that with a grain of salt. But at any rate, to the best of its knowledge, 33 different people have visited this site. 52 visits, 76 pages, 256 hits, and a bandwidth of 2.07 megabytes. So if you have one of those plans where you are restricted to how many uh, uh, your bandwidth and how many bytes that you have, um, you would want to monitor that to make sure that you you don't use up all your bandwidth and that uh, you know because if you were getting close, you could then go you know like kind of like cell phone minutes, right? You could go and you could ask for uh, you could pay for, for for some more. They have some nice little graphs here that show you a history. Um, also. Interesting things, how people are reaching this site. What people have searched for. What browsers are being used. Despite everything, IE still has 40%. And IE, yeah, IE, previous to IE9, in other words, the problematic browsers, has still roughly, if my math is right, over 24%. So as over one out of five people are using a browser that we know kind of has problems with HTML5 and all that. Now I will say that, that these are, st one thing you have to do sometimes with these stats is take them with a little bit of grain of salt because stats depend on the kind of site you're running. All right? If you're running a site, for example, that is geared towards the general public, you might get one set of stats. If you're running, say, a technical or a graphic design blog, you're liable to get, like, really high-end users. So it might be skewed one way or another, your browser usage. So when you see generalized statistics, you do have to kind of take into account what that is. And again, it's good to sort of know um, who the visitors to your site are, are. So what this is useful is, remember we talked about all those things uh, like, like um, graceful degradation and all that and, and getting cross-browser compatibility. If, for example, you know that something doesn't work in IE 9 or, or earlier, or I'm sorry, and earlier than IE9, you could look at the stats and see how many people this would affect. And in this case, it's going to affect 20% of the people. Yeah, that's probably kind of important. I'd want to make sure that I have a really good workaround. If I looked at it, if on the other hand, I had something that didn't work on the Opera browser, let's say, I look and say, well, 1.5% of the people, well, okay, we don't want it to break necessarily, but I'm going to be less concerned about providing them a great option. Maybe I'll provide them a good option instead. All right. As much as we can theoretically say, you know, 
well, we want the site to look identical and all that. You know, there's always the, the practicalities of the situation that, that, um, that uh, intervene. Let's see which countries are visiting the site. The last visits. and so on. All these things are very important in terms of, of marketing your website and going beyond that, as well as on a technical level to know how much bandwidth you're using uh, and so on. So this is another thing that web hosting services provide. Now, Ostas is just one of, or AWStats, I'm not sure how you're supposed to read that, but it's just one tool. There are other tools available as well um, that you can look at and get a different view um, of your site. Read through the book. I'm sure they have some good insights uh, about that. And also talk to people, especially if you're considering a hosting service. You know, talk to people and see what they've been using. And, um, you know, consider things beyond price. Obviously, price is important, but other things are important as well. Questions? All right. Now, what I'm going to do now is we'll end the recording of the lecture because we'll have the class evaluation. For the online folks, uh, I believe there will be links on ANGEL for you to fill out a separate evaluation. So this is just for the on-campus folks. So let me finish up here.